back. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Full Frame 2014. I'm Sadie Tillery. I'm the Director of Programming for the festival. And welcome to the a and &E Indie Films Speakeasy. I'd like to start out just by thanking a and &E Indie Films for making this space for conversation possible over the four days, and also Junior Johnson for um, the moonshine, the libations that keep the conversation flowing. So um, thank you all for being here again. and. There were a number of films at the festival this year where the director was actually the person behind the camera shooting. And I felt like it was important to have a conversation about the role of being behind the actual lens. Um, Robin Smith is a longtime member of the Full Frame family, serves on our selection committee, and worked for the festival for many years and um, we're really excited to have her moderate this conversation. One more piece of housekeeping. We hope that you'll have some questions to ask the panel, and if you would, please come to the two microphones to ask. Um, that would be a great help. Robin? All right, welcome everybody. So um, as Deirdre has explained and Sadie earlier, this is very relaxed. You can come and go. You do not have to worry about uh, picking up and going to a film. We're going to have a conversation and we want you all to participate at some point. We'll start at first by just talking amongst ourselves here, but please, um, I'll let you know at some point. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And because it's 3.30, it is officially sort of happy hour and there's moonshine back there. <laughs> and I think Full Frame is probably the only festival that has barbecue and moonshine. So please make sure you have some of that and then your questions might be more lively and interesting too, who knows. So you all know what the panel is about. Um, it's wonderful to have all three of these filmmakers here. Um, I've been at the festival since 2000, and each of them has been here on several occasions. So it's wonderful to welcome each of you, Doug Block, Lucia Smalls, and Jesse Moss. And um, so the, the each of these filmmakers um, makes films where they are the cinematographer and the director. Um, Jesse, you've made films in different ways as well, haven't you? I think you've have you had experience with both both ways. Yes, yeah. um, but um, the three feature documentaries I've made, I've, I've, I've all sh I've shot or co co shot one, but but yeah, TV work mostly with cinematographers. So I'd love to know for each of you what made you choose to be to to approach it uh, th this dual role. And um, Lucia, let's start with you. I think let's put you on the spot first. So um, because I think you've got some pretty specific reasons why you began shooting this particular style. From the beginning? No, the beginning. no. Yes. Or this? <laughs> no. Um, well, I've worked both ways as well, um, and I actually love collaboration. And even this piece that I have at the festival, One Cut, One Life, is a collaboration where I'm shooting and my film partner is shooting and we're shooting each other. So um, Make sure you let everyone know who your film partner was, I think. Okay, Ed, Ed Pincus, who actually um, passed away in November. Um, and that was part of the content of the film, that he got sick. And he actually was a cinematographer first and shot films always, you know, he was the principal cinematographer since his first film in 1965. So when we teamed up on our previous film, he was the principal cinematographer, although I filmed as well. But this particular project um, required that I become the principal photographer as, as, as he, he had Parkinson's, that was part of his illness, and as he started to not be able to hold the camera, I took on more and more of the role. And it, it, it's, um, it's a very intimate story about our relationship and, and the relationship we have as film partners and to film, so it made sense that we would be behind the camera, each of us, and we wanted, we wanted our audience to feel as if they were there right with us. So having another camera person wouldn't have been as intimate, wouldn't have created the same feeling you get when you're right next to someone. So another reason for picking up the camera. And it seems that that is um, one of the great benefits of, of you know shooting in this way, Jesse. Your experience and choosing this this style of, of making films, and, and why did you choose that? Um, well. Uh, I, I don't really know any other way to make this kind of film. Um, as I said, the other two films I've made like this that were um, unfunded um, and more observational cinema verite in style, 
Um, and let me interrupt. Jesse's film is The Overnighters, which is screened this yeah. evening at Hi. 7 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that's the way I know how to work. And, and I... Um, um, and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the resources to call on anybody to, to, to help me, but I actually just, I like to work that way. And um, I also was sort of, wasn't sure I was still willing or able to work that way, but I, I, I knew it, it, it was a method that was familiar to me and that was um, um, available. And, and I wanted to sort of see if I could recapture some of what I felt making those films 10 years ago, um, where I was just working by myself and kind of embedded in, um, in, in somebody's life. Um, and it, it, um, intimacy is the first thing you think about when you think about going in just yourself with just your camera. And Doug, I think um, your films, your body of work, certainly uh, I think you've gotten quite intimate. You've filmed your family. Um, can you speak about your what brought you to this kind of work and why, why choose this role? Um, yeah, I, in a word, necessity. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, you know, my, my background is as a camera person, you know, shooting for others. Um, and I did that for many years. And when it came time, you know, for me to do my first film, I, uh, you know, I just didn't have the money <laughs> to hire <laughs> a crew. Still, you know, I never do when I'm starting these things. Um, and I dream of the day when I can have a really good DP and I just sit back. So you would know, you do that? <laughs> would I do that? Would you, would you do that, hire a DP? You would, I would you love would break to. From? I'd and love by the way, to. Doug's film last night, how many of you were at opening night last night? Okay, fantastic film. That was Doug's film. And I think Thanks. the only problem with the screening last night is that where sometimes you couldn't hear what they were saying because people were laughing so loudly and That's enjoying a, it so much. So it's a, a great a, problem a to have. A terrible problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> so you would, so, so talk about what, um, what shooting it yourself brings to the project and, and why would you do yeah, something? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, 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 I'm not really complaining because I do love that style. And, um, uh, you know, it's always bizarre to me when I was shooting for other people, when I would do the interviews, and the interviewer would be slightly off screen, and so the, p the person's looking <laughs> at somebody out there. I, I always thought that was the most weirdly artificial cons construct mm -hmm. uh, that we all kind of accept without question. And um, I always liked it when they talked right into the lens that there's just something much more intimate and that shooting this way, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of part of it. You know, I, I, was, I was also working with filmmakers who just work like crazy to phrase their questions so that the person being interviewed would, would do complete sentences so that their questions were never part of the interview. Right. Um, so I liked, <laughs> I liked this sort of device where, um, where you know, the, the filmmaker is part of the story in a way. You know, you hear the questions from behind the camera and they're, you know, this very direct contact. And I think, you know, the big influence for me was the work of Ross McElwee and specifically Sherman's March. And that idea, I mean, I, I actually had no intention of making documentaries before I saw that. Um, it was the first documentary where um, I felt like First, it was as entertaining as any fiction film I'd seen, but that it was really director-driven and, um, and that it was all about that interaction be 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 between this presence behind the camera and the subject. It was really you know, a, a groundbreaking to me and like opened up a whole realm of possibility of what you could do um, in the nonfiction realm. I think I remember hearing Michael Moore speak at the festival a couple of years ago, the same film. He walked into a theater and saw that film and thought, I'm going to make films too. I can do that too. Yeah. So Jesse, when you are behind the camera, you're a one person crew, how does that change um, the relationship as a, from a filmmaker to subject? Does it make you more bold? Does it take you to new places you wouldn't be able to, to go to if you had a, a crew with you? I think it really does. I mean, I, I feel like it really fundamentally gives me a lot of freedom. It comes with burdens, right? I mean, the sort of the technical burdens and the physical burdens. But but I find that what it, what it gives, what the benefits of, of sort of creative um, freedom and a lack of obligation to to concern myself emotionally and kind of practically with a crew, are, are, those are really significant obligations in, in a like a in this experience a kind of t tough environment to work in where I not having to worry about anybody else. 
Can you give people a brief description sure. of what your film is about? Um, my film's set in an oil boom town in North Dakota, and it's about a Lutheran pastor who opens his church to help and to house some of the many thousands of men and women who have flocked to North Dakota to find work um, in the booming oil fields. And that decision to open his church and to, to, to accept these men and uh, let them sleep on the uh, floor of his church and in the parking lot puts him in conflict with his congregation and his community and his um, his own family. So that's what the film is really, that's about. And and so when I um, when I first went up there, I mean, I, I went with no resources and my own camera, and, and um, but which is how I like to work, and I wasn't necessarily considering working any other way, but immediately in that environment, like there, I had nowhere to sleep, um, and I certainly wouldn't have been able to put up anybody. And But I, I just, um, I, I, I find that um, it allows me to, even though I have the apparatus, I have the camera, I have the lens um, between us, that um, it allows me to be much more available um, emotionally um, for, for my subjects, and that um, not only it, sort of in, in capturing their attention, but in directing mine back, um, so. You know, it seems that for new filmmakers, first-time filmmakers, Doug, you were mentioning that it's it's an easy um, sort of entrance ramp to to making a documentary because it's less money involved. You just have your camera, but it's not easy to make this kind of film. So, Lucia, and then Doug, I'd love you to follow up after that. Um, why is it difficult? I mean, what are the difficulties that might be um, hidden or you might not think about in making a film? yourself shooting it yourself oh the the moment where you you think you're filming this amazing scene and you realize <laughs> you've thought about so many different things and you're asking the most poignant questions and you forgot to push the record button <laughs> that that moment no I mean so <laughs> I, I, I've seen cameraman make that mistake. <laughs> that's true that's true no I think um, it's interesting because I'm listening to, to my two cohorts talk here, and um, I didn't think I had the physical physical ability to shoot. Um, I earlier there were bigger cameras, and I was always intimidated about picking up a camera. And now the cameras are much more accessible, and more and more people are doing it. But I had to literally like force myself to do this. And um, fortunately, I had this amazing film partner who was not intimidated at all and actually helped build one of the original cameras that shot first person and had his own mic and was able to come up with a, a system. And Ed Pincus is known, uh, am I correct, as the father of direct cinema by some people believe that. N not direct cinema, but first but person first documentary. Person. In fact, he was Ross's teacher. Right. So he was the first one to begin to talk from behind the camera. You know, he had the traditional direct cinema fly on the wall and he started to realize that so much was being shaped by his, even his angle and what he was capturing he started to break that fourth wall and um, many people I don't know have seen his work. Um, uh, his film was shown here at the festival. Anyone here seen some of his diaries? Um, Acts in the Attic was uh, yeah. was one of Lucia's films. But before. Diaries was one of the ones he, he, he sort of broke that um, formality with. So I think that um, there's always, oh, Breaking up, aren't I? Should I? Yeah, I think you okay. sound, Is everybody the, up, you can hear? There's always the technical challenge of of that. Um, I think, I think it's there's pros and cons with every choice you make in this kind of work. Um, the intimacy is is mm -hmm. there indeed, but you, there's an intimacy you can get with a partner that you're in sync with, and if you have sound, not and you're not having to think about sound there's a fluidity that can happen that's magical. Um, when you're doing it all by yourself, it's, it's actually um, more intimidating, but, it, but you get a trust that you can develop with your subject that's very different. So that's interesting. If you think about whether it emboldens you, uh, you mentioned, I mean, it's all, it sounds lonely in a way, in some ways. Does, does it, do you hold back sometimes? Doug, if you, were, if you had a crew with you, do you think you would feel more bold to shoot things, how differently would that be? I, I don't know that it would change a lot of things other than I, I do think there's a, a, an intimacy that you can create by being a single person crew. I mean, certainly with 112 weddings, you know, to go back and interview these couples whose weddings I filmed, you know, many years later, um, I think it would have been a very different interview if I'd shown up even with just a sound person. 
but the idea that I, I shot their wedding as a single person crew. And then, um, you know, it's just me talking to them with very little light. I, I, I take one light on a stand, you know, to bounce off, to get a kind of level. Um, uh, sometimes, sometimes, I, you know, with Heather and Sam, I just use the light coming through the apartment window. But um, uh, so I think, I think you gain so much more by doing it that way. But as we're alluding to, it technically, it's really challenging because you have to you have to play so many roles at one time, and you have to be so aware of of audio and of lighting. And you know, one of the things that um, you know I learned about shooting early on when I was mainly shooting with others is um, that I think a big big part of your role as a camera person uh, in documentary is to make your subjects feel c comfortable when a camera is pointed at them. It's a very kind of unnatural <laughs> thing for people to have. A, and, and I started in the days when the cameras were huge, you know, those beta cams, and weighed 25 pounds. And, and you come into people's living rooms or kitchens or whatever, and they just think, TV. <laughs> I'm going to be on TV. And, and so like the big. I always thought it like the biggest, most important part of my job was to make them feel relaxed and joke around and, and, and keep things very light and informal yeah. so that it just didn't feel intimidating for them and they could be relaxed in themselves. But like, you know, then, you, then you're, you're when, when you're shooting documentaries as a single person crew, you know, you're, let's say you're doing an interview you know, I'm, I, wh while I'm trying to keep them relaxed, I'm sort of also looking behind them and like <laughs> looking at the light. Is that like light overwhelming the light on their face? And it's like the left side and your right side of your brain are like just warring with right. each other. So it's, um, you know, I'm very grateful that I had many years of camera experience before I started to do this, that I could just, um, you know, so that I didn't have to think a lot about the shooting when I'm doing it, it's kind of very intuitive and natural, and I can really focus on on all these other things. And then when I'm shooting, I'm really doing my best to listen hmm. and be in the moment. And um, first of all, if I'm in the film or I'm part of the film, I'm also always sort of thinking through what my role in the film is. And That's so um, <laughs> you know, so yeah. all that's sort of going on, but like it's like an actor, I guess, who prepares really hard by reading the script and doing all their homework, and then in the moment of um, action, forgets everything and just is spontaneous and open and listening to the other actor. Yeah, yeah. and I think I think not having those other um, people around oh. you helps you to to kind of perform in that moment. I I feel to sort of. Um, to, to, to remove them from your um, considerations and to, to, to be available. Um, I wanted to say, actually, you mentioned, uh, I think, um, I, I, lonely. I, find it, I found it kind of lonely to not have uh, collaborators with me. And um, it was a lot of days um, of production over a fairly long period of time to, to not have somebody to commiserate with or to strategize with. And, um, and I think there were benefits to that, which is that I'm kind of temperamentally a more reserved and shy person, and it so it forces me to kind of step out and to actually kind of be in in the world of the people that I'm filming and working with. Yeah. Um, but but I, I did I I didn't like that you know uh, I think I think that it it it, it paid you know benefited the, the project in other ways, but but I found it kind of isolating you know and um, and and I will say that I have seen extraordinary intimate. Cinema verite movies that were done with crews and 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 a cameraman and a sound man and and so it's not that I think you can um, you know achieve better results. Uh, it's just um, it's sort of by necessity my working method that I've grown attached to. Um, but the other one, the qu quick technical thing, which I felt like I don't know if you guys had to make this choice, but I did, which was starting out this project. Do I shoot? small on a DSLR or do I shoot bigger? And I ended up actually working with a bigger camera on my shoulder, even though I felt like a 5D would have been much more low profile. I shot with a Sony F3 and I built it out. And by the time I built it out, it looked like a television camera, which is, you know, has, has 
pluses and minuses. People are like, oh, it's TV or oh, it's TV, right? And and um, but I thought, you know, because I'm working by myself, I need like a, I can't run double system for audio. I need a camera that really is has professional audio, so I need something big, bigger. I did. I didn't have a better system, so. I had that, we had that discussion, Ed and I, in fact, we ended up on the small, a much smaller camera, and I was running the double system, and it was a bit of a um, challenge. It was like going back into film and, and tape world and trying to sync up, and um, I mean, luckily we had a mounted camera as well. We had two cameras that we were, um, the same two cameras, we each had our own, so we had a mounted mic, which was a godsend, but Definitely, and part of that decision was physically we could not hold. He could not hold the larger camera anymore on his on his shoulder, and I couldn't I couldn't either. But um, what I found what was interesting is I started to hold the camera up to my face, and so they you know you had to talk to me with the big camera and a big fuzzy microphone. So um, but Ed was accustomed to it. And I think I think that's what Doug's talking about trust. I mean, just spending time with your subject, whatever camera, however large it is, it's the time, and especially the time when you're not shooting. Sometimes when you put the camera down and you have the conversations with your subjects and you gain that trust, um, that that's a really important time. And it's interesting when you're shooting alone. I find that you want to shoot more because you want to make sure you don't miss something. Um, but the exercise to sort of put it down and just be still without it is, um, is, is one of the most important things I learned through this process of making a film. Um, and, and you can't always communicate that to a camera person. There's, there's pros and cons, as I said earlier, like when a camera person, when you're not in sync, and you're not in sync with your partner, it can be a little bit of a um, logistical mind field. So, um, but I wanted to say one thing. I wanted to ask the audience how many people are filming and shooting their own work out there? Wow. Wow, yes. Scary. So maybe Doug <laughs> should tell what kind of camera you're working with too, because I think it may be of interest sure. to you guys. Sure. Um, <laughs> I've been using the uh, the Panasonic HMC150 for about five years now, and I actually haven't even upgraded. I, I love the look of it. It's very warm, and it's very user friendly, and I like the um, store, you know, the uh, workflow. You just, you know, it's such a simple workflow with, uh, I, I hate the double system complications. Yeah. And I was, just, I was gonna say, on that, just on that note too, like I, I, I really don't particularly want to work with a, a DP on a film like this, but I, I would love to work with a media manager. Just like that's <laughs> really hard because, yeah. you know, you, wor you should work for, you know, a long, it's a killer day and you come home and you have to do media management and that takes two hours yeah. and you can't fuck it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, but that's where I want to pass it off. But there's another, there's another issue involved here in that we do, um, you know, I, I, I should make the distinction between the way, the styles that we work in. It, um, it's not just shooting by yourself, but you're doing basically verite footage as if you had a classic crew. Um, whereas I'm doing specifically one person filming uh, often autobiographical works with my family or with um, people I know where I'm part of the story. Yeah. So it's a very different set of priorities. You know, you're going to be much more cognizant of the look and having that kind of classic look um, just with the disadvantage of not having more of the crew that you'd want, particularly a sound person. Um, whereas for me, I am willing to sacrifice certain tech, you know, the look a bit if I have to. You know, to me it's about the energy and about not missing a moment, like particularly with family. It's like w when I did the film, the, film uh, the Kids Grow Up, with, you know, about my daughter, I had to be ready in like 30 seconds when she was willing to let me film her. I couldn't like, I couldn't stick a radio mic on her for the life of me, you know, no way, no how. So it's all about, um, and, and for that style of filming, I think, you know, if it's a little shaky, if it's not like perfect lighting, it's, it's forgiven because it's all part of, I think, the aesthetic of that kind of film. And, you know, certainly if you look at Ross's films, he's a, he's a, he's a good camera person, but he leaves in all sorts of shaky shots intentionally because it's sort of part of the feel. Part of the story. Yeah. Too. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different um, thing when 
when you're in it and and uh, it's, it's it's an interesting distinction. But uh, but the sound has to be good enough to hear. So, but for each of you, whatever um, you know, whatever your oh, oh time no, story. Oh yes, sorry. one of Go ahead. one of Ross's most memorable scenes is when the sound went off. Yeah, I know. Yeah. In I've, I've used March. that too okay. out of so necessity. But you know, know, it also there's another thing about how <laughs> if you don't have radio mics or a sound person, it actually dictates how you shoot. Yeah. Because you know, I'm I'm often using a good directional Sennheiser mic on the camera, but it means I need to be in closer and I have to watch. You know, if I'm shooting a scene with a number of people talking, you know, I have to be really focused on the editing as I'm shooting and to not pan away so that the, the camera mic is off the person yeah. talking while yeah. they're talking and then be aware that I have to get cutaways later. And, I and feel like we could have also like a whole separate technical discussion too because ne shooting for me on a, on a camera with a PL mount and, and, a, and a film cinema lens I can only afford one lens, and and they don't. It's really, really expensive to get a, a, a um, PL mount lens with a very long zoom range, and so I'd have very short range, and and because I just couldn't rent two lenses, and so I'd have to. It would really affect how I'd have to work in that environment, and also the introduction of those kinds of cameras for someone like me who didn't. I don't. I'm not really well schooled in cinematography, and I realized how how little I actually knew about um, cinematography. Right. And, and, and that I, I didn't have to know it when, with the previous generation of cameras that right. I was using. And suddenly, my understanding of, um, uh, uh, of some of this became much more critical. And, and I, it was a steep and something somewhat enjoyable learning curve, but, but I also felt like some of these technical discussions had real creative impact and like how the choices I would have to make and actually covering a scene and how close I would have to be both with sound and, and, and you know, where I was on the lens, so it's just. I wanna go to the audience in just a minute to um, get some questions from, from you guys, so be ready for that. But I wanna ask one question first. When you are, um, again, going back to the question of does it embolden you or how does it change sort of your relationship with the subject when you are behind the camera and it's just you there and there's no one else there, do you ever find yourself in a situation or in a scene, and each of your films have sort of seen times where something like this could have happened where, um, you feel like you got more um, access, you, you were witnessing an intimate moment that you might not have gotten, and has that ever made you uncomfortable? And Jesse, let's start and go in order if we could, because Jesse's gonna dance around some of these things here, but yeah, so there's since nobody's seen his yeah, film. And Lucia, you too, since so nobody's seen your oh, film. There's some very intimate scenes in the film, and I think um, the, the, the intimacy in the film, which develops is really built on I think the foundation of, 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 of the film is that is working is was the period where I worked by myself uh, well I worked the whole time by myself but like um, I spent the first six months of the film sleeping in this church with these men and and, be, and I was able to do that because I was by myself and and I, th I think the intimacy that developed out of that relationship and um, close proximity to my subjects um, does become very uh, became very um, uncomfortably intimate, I would say, um, and uh, for me and for my subjects. And um, but I do think that um, I think that my I'd say both the trust and the prof the low relatively low profile that I I had allowed me to just be there for for some scenes that um, might have otherwise. Um, um, been impossible to film, and so those scenes that were uncomfortable for me and in their intimacy are also the, the most powerful scenes in the film, as they tend to be. Anyone have tickets for that film yet? If you don't, um, that's a good. <laughs> uh, let's leave it at that, and uh, and and you can ask questions of Jesse after you've seen his film, Lucia. If you can answer the question. Yeah, there's no question that the intimacy that I got on my film was because I was shooting, and and I I. Ed used to say to me, be one with your camera, Lucia, be one with your camera, which I thought was wonderful advice. Um, but it takes you a while to feel that fluidity. Um, but once you have that, um, yes, an intimacy can be created. And in a way, shooting, when it's so emotional, um, it protects you. There's a lens between you and the reality and you're framing it, and so it's it's a way to distill 
that reality. And um, so I find that this, um, it's a gift to be able to shoot on your own. I mean, I like having a wonderful camera person with me too, but to be able to get at some of these really intimate, raw truths. And you guys openly discuss that in your film. I mean, it's, there's there are some scenes where it is openly discussed, so that's... This is true. Yes. And, and, and you know, there there's, uh, without going into the film too much, Ed's wife, Jane, did not want this film to be made, so there's a lot of um, talk about the camera and the presence of the camera and, and, and what that means to a life and to um, a situation, so... But then she picks up the camera, which I love. She picks up the camera again and again, so it's, it's nice. And Doug, your films always, th the realities in your films are sometimes so painful because they're so family oriented. They're about things we can all relate to. So I think it's interesting what Lucia just said. Sometimes does the camera um, enable you to go deeper into something that's more personal? Being absolutely, behind. absolutely. I mean, I would, you know, <coughs> so, excuse me. Um, do you need some moonshine? <coughs> oh, sure. I can do some water. Really? Would you like some moonshine here? Could we get some moonshine? Can we get three here, glasses? No, four glasses? No, she's in. I, I just remember with uh, <laughs> the, the film I made about my parents, 51 Birch Street. Um, I, was, I would never have been able to ask some of the questions of my father um, without the protection of the camera. Um, and the same of my daughter, you know, in The Kids Grow Up. I mean, it. it forced me to put on my professional face, you know, and ask, you know, the kinds of questions that, you know, the hard questions that you need to do with the camera. So and it's almost like a piece of armor, I feel like. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's sort of this equipment that you, I do, I feel that way sometimes, like you sort of build it and you put it on and you put it down, but it's, it is a kind of, you know, protection. It's like a different person when you have the camera on. Yeah, I, th I think, I think a big thing, a big important thing for, for you guys shooting your films is just to shoot and shoot and shoot. I mean, just get used to shooting and practice and um, the more <laughs> the more you do it. What's this water doing here? <laughs> We're drinking. You oh guys Oh my gosh, you drink. really did bring more moonshine. Um, oh, well, I guess we'll have to. The more you do cheers. it. <laughs> this is like a quadruple. Here's yes. like, um, <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Where's your moonshine? I, I got the water. They're telling me. <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> oh, here you can have. But the more, that's okay. The more the more you do it, the more comfortable and the organic it is. Um, you know, the more the, the better the results will be. You know, it does take a lot of of um, doing it. All right. So we saw a lot of hands go up about filmmakers. This is your moment. Yes, go ahead. I'm very curious about this. Um, last night you thanked an editor. Uh, you um, and so here you guys have done all the shooting, and I'm wondering how is that handing that over to an editor, and what is the process after you do that? Because I, I, you know, I wonder how you're going to allow them to pick the shots, or is how, I mean, just explain how that works. That's all. Thank you. Well, you're not exactly allowing them to pick the shot. I mean, you're 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 going through. <laughs> I, if, if, at least my method is. Uh, I'm curious about you guys, but I sit down and watch all the footage with the editor, we take notes, we talk about it endlessly. Um, and then I leave the editor alone to make the first pass at it. But, but you're, you're handing off something, I think what you're saying that's been so intimate for you that you've sort of, you've, you've sort of made the film in the camera and then you hand it off right. and share it with someone. But you're so telling a story and what, you, what I want in an editor is a storytelling collaborator who can stand outside, particularly with these personal autobiographical films, who's seeing it more objectively um, and just seeing story, you know, looking at me as a character in a story. Um, and, you know, uh, I want somebody who has a really strong vision, you know. I mean, it's not like I'm handing it over and saying, go make my film for me, but. But it's true that my editor doesn't care that I had to work really hard to shoot a particular scene. <laughs> he, it doesn't matter to him that I had to sleep on a flea-infested couch. He, you know, it's of no. C I mean, I might fight for it for that reason, but he doesn't care. Um, it's also. It, I mean, I don't have to watch my dailies, which is good. Like, I feel like if, you know, if you you're shooting with a DP, you want to. I mean, you know, sp I'd spend more time looking at their work, and I don't have to come home and watch it. Um, but um, yeah, I I, um, I think it was such an essential um, collaboration because it was so isolating, and all those decisions were made 
um, by myself um, to have somebody who um, could look at it with some distance and was prepared to fight with me about it, which is what I really uh, wanted. Well, luckily I have multiple personalities uh, <laughs> because I'm the editor. Um, no, I, I no actually Ed and I worked looked at the footage together, but he didn't really want to look at anything that I hadn't cut. So I initially cut a four-hour cut of the film, and he's like, "Why is it so long? What can, can you cut this scene down?" I was, so so I don't know. I mean, I I've worked with editors. I worked with. Karen Schmier um, on my first film, and that was a dream come true. She was, a, um, if you guys, she's cut a lot of Errol Morris's films. She's cut many, many films. She, she unfortunately passed away about four years ago, but working with her was fabulous, and I shot half of my first film. But this film, I actually had to edit, so um, it's, I had to, I did have to sort of play editor. I put on my editor's cap and, and put the director out there, it's very interesting process. I'm not sure I'm always successful, so I bring lots of editor friends into the editing room and people who will sit with me and review and say, okay, that. Um, but for the most part, um, you do want to trust your editor to see things that you haven't done, you haven't seen. And it's, it's, a so, it's such a gift to work with an editor who can sort of see what you've done and, and pull these pieces together, so. I don't know. I mean, I think no, it's. Do you edit too? Do you cut your yeah, cut stuff? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I can, but I don't. Yeah. I prefer not to. I, I, yeah. I love the collaboration with yeah. an editor because I always end up cutting some stuff, and it's really. I mean, it, uh, you know, good DPs need to think like editors too. They do, and I think. Um, um, I'm you know I'm always thinking, even though I. My, I have an, an editor in this film. I, you're always thinking like an editor when you're shooting coverage, and well, or even if you're shooting a film that's more first-person personal. I mean, you're still thinking about the component. I mean, I hate to put it so crudely, but the sort of components, the building blocks of the scene or the moment that you're shooting, and do you have what you need? And um, I like the fact that I have no one to blame but myself because I'm, you know, I get lazy and. Um, and um, I think working by myself, I just know I, there's no one I can point the finger at when I don't get what I need to get. Yeah, I think editing is is, is the best background for shooting. That you really need to be steeped in in, in a knowledge, basic knowledge of editing and how to put scenes together and uh, you know read the five C's of cinematography and um, because you're constantly shooting with the editing in mind. You know, uh, yeah. did I get did I get a cutaway? Right. Did I get that establishing shot? I, you know, so many film uh, documentaries I see by neophyte camera people um, are all medium shots. You know, they just don't think to go in. I heard a great one today. When in doubt, zoom out. <laughs> Sorry, I love that. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> no, but I mean, <laughs> but that's what makes it cinematic. Yes. Are the are the you know it's the vocabulary of cinema to go you know to have those wide shots that mm -hmm. establish or mm -hmm. or conclude a scene or 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 put the story in the context of the landscape um, and and the close-ups you know of course um, but also and then and then the real art I guess is knowing when to move from one to the other while the action's going on and mm -hmm. that's the you know that's that's where I think uh, experience comes in yeah Jesse you look like you're thinking about no, more I mean, advice I, for I, filmmakers. I, always, I you know I, I, I f for as long as I feel like I've been doing this and I guess I don't shoot really shoot that mu not nearly as much as professional DPs because I only make one film every five years and Jesse you know. made Con Man. Anyone here seen Con Man years ago? I, don't know how I didn't shoot that around. actually. No, I shot I, that? no, I shot okay. some footage on, but I shot Speedo, was which was here, and Speedo, then Full Battle yes. Rattle, like co shot. Right. And um, but I, you know, the thing like I, I, see, I look at you know work. I don't know Albert Mazels or other you know great handheld DPs, and there's a way in which they really follow the action and continuous shots, and it's partly the the you know um, the films were you know. I'm a product of my times and like the rhythms of my editing tend to be a little faster probably and I don't you know have the same kind of patience or my editors don't have the same kind of patience and I don't have the technical skill to actually follow and rack focus action conversation you know what I tend to kind of it's my weakness you kind of think more in like shot reverse shot wide shot you know whatever it is you know sort of mechanically and I wish I aspire to be more uh, fluid 
you know, and I think there's a kind of fluidity in cinematography that is I strive for, but I, you know, I don't know if I'll get there. And Lucia, did you want to say something? Any moments during making your films that you were thinking to yourself, if only I had a crew with me, this would have been easier? Are there any? There's one moment I thought, I wish I had a crane, but. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions right now? Well, you guys, filmmakers, don't be shy. Go ahead. It, I think you need to come to the mic, though, because they're recording. Am I correct about that? Yeah. Okay. So sorry about that. Otherwise, you could just shout it out. Definitely applies to some films more than others, but um, when you're shooting, um, I think like ethical situations can sometimes become tricky. Um, shooting alone makes you kind of question yourself more than having a partner to be like, is this ethical? Which, how should we approach this and whatnot? So not from a creative standpoint, but like an ethical one. How does shooting alone change situations? Thanks. It's a really interesting That's question. Yeah. Very good yeah. question. Um, yeah. I mean, there were some. There were two really tricky ethical scenarios in my film, and uh, uh, one was when I was. I, the one I can. Talk, it's easier to talk about now is when I was. Um, I was shooting my main subject, and somebody pulled a gun on him and threatened to shoot him and to shoot me, and I thought, you know, it's partly ethical and partly just kind of rational, but like, you know, do I? This woman's asking me to stop filming, and she's threatening to shoot my subject. I should stop, right? because I don't want to get killed making a documentary. And it's also, a shotgun, isn't it? I mean, it's it a, rifle. A, a rifle. And I, it's but a I also thought, gun. what kind of fucking filmmaker am I who would, who would like turn the camera off in the moment when his subject's getting held at gunpoint, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's a sort of dueling rational and irrational um, spirit. And um, That scene doesn't I don't know, linger I, just long enough to make you feel uncomfortable for you. I, I, yeah, I guess it's not so much a, you know, an ethical, I mean, it is, I, you know, she was probably legally in the right and legally could have shot us, but, but it, you know, I, I did think, you know, what's the responsible re relationship to the, what's happening here? And, and if I was with a crew, I would never put other people in jeopardy, but because of, with it's, it's me, what the hell? I don't want to overly interpret your question, but is it sort of a voyeuristic quality when you're turning the camera on people you know, and is there a moment where you feel like you've gone too far? Is that yeah. sort yeah. of where you're, yeah? Well, I, I, I'm not sure there's, uh, I, you, you, you face that problem, I think, whether you're with a crew or without a crew, but um, I mean, I certainly think about all, that all the time. You know, am I overstepping my bounds? Am I invading privacy? I mean, there was a scene in The Kids Grow Up about my daughter, and it was right before she went off to college, and she was, things were, you know, everybody was getting stressed out. And I did one too many interviews with her, and she just starts breaking down in tears and going, I hate this. And um, I swear to God, like half the reviews, question why I didn't turn the camera off, but she never told me to turn the camera off. It was a different scene once where she told me to turn the camera off. And, and, and so, I, but I was thinking the whole time, oh my God, you know, do I keep filming? And I'm trying to, you know, work this out with her while she's in this state. And, and um, you know, so in the moment, you're, you're often questioning that, but, um, my tendency is to like, unless somebody points a gun <laughs> or, you know, when they tell me to turn it off, I turn it off. Um, if they don't, you know, I will often err on the side of keeping it going. And then, you know, you have this thing called editing where, you know, the ethics really come into play in the editing. Um, uh, I'm always thinking, you know, are we, is this too invasive? Are they, um, am I, I think I referred to in the Q&A last night with 112 Weddings, you know, where, where you know, we're talking about, are they, uh, am I, they're, they're very vulnerable to opening up to me in a way that maybe they, they didn't even realize they were, and now I have the power to make them look really bad. You know, how far can I go without overstepping that bound? That's an editing call, not a filming call. Except when there's a gun, like that's I, I've never been in that situation. Um, the only time I was in the situation that you're talking about was when I was in New Orleans shooting, um, shooting, oh, axe in the attic. yeah, the axe in the attic post um, Katrina, and there was a lot of there were a lot of situations where actually 
people would run and track us down and want us to mm -hmm. film and beg us to film so that we would have testi their testimony. And then there were other people who were like, you are preying on us, you're carpet beggars, and you know, the emotions were charged. And to have a partner to process all that with was, I don't know, I wouldn't have been able to make the film. I don't, I wouldn't have been able to make that film without my partner. But um, I'm now considering, actually, this is my, what I call my triptych of first person documentary, and I'm going to go back to, um, Second person, um, and I, I do I do wonder: Can I do it by myself? Can I do this in a situation that might be dangerous, or what what should I do? And I I found that even when I'm on the road and I am when I was up in Vermont and shooting and Ed was there, I often had to call my friends. I called a lot of friends, like film friends, and process things at night about it so even though it wasn't right in the middle of a moment like that like Jesse's talking about I, I do find that there is a community that you can talk about this stuff with and that as Doug mentioned you always you should shoot it you should keep the camera running as long as you can because you can always edit it out and that is the final that's the final decision I just wanted to add one thing about that um, which is thinking about you know what we're all talking about is what what this kind of work allows us to do is really drop some of the barriers that typically exist between us and our subjects and our relationships and create this intimacy that is the lifeblood of our films. But one of the things that happens, I found happened for me, um, it's, you have a different set of considerations when it's family members, but you become incredibly close to these people, closer perhaps than you might otherwise, and because it's just you, because you're, you know, you're working by yourself and and they begin to relate to you not, you know, oh, just as a filmmaker, but as confidant, a friend. Um, I became something of the pastor's pastor. And for some of these men, they would say, you know, in like moments of crisis, uh, one, one, one subject in particular, you know, what he, he was deciding whether to stay or leave North Dakota. And it was a lot of drama in his personal life. And he was, as I was filming the scene, he's asking me, what do I do, you know? And I'm thinking, what do I say? Do I just keep rolling and not say anything? Do I try to kind of say something, but it really is saying nothing? Or do I say what I really think? You know, and that was, and here he, this guy's in like one of the most dramatic moments of his life in terms of the choice he's facing. And he's asking me to help him as a human being. And I'm you know, there's no, you know, there's no sort of guideline, you know, and, and it's only sort of our own sense of what, you know, uh, our relation is to other human beings and 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 to you know so there were m moments in this several where i you know i could I, I was forced to stop thinking as a sort of removed filmmaker and and um, became something more in a, in a much more complicated way but that is actually just to finish, finish. Sorry. Please go ahead. The, the, the sort of, I, I think those questions really go to the heart of a lot of documentary, and and and, and they're sometimes uncomfortable to talk about, and and because they don't provide easy answers, and and sometimes they're hard to look at, and for filmmakers to talk about. But but I think they are like a lot of powerful documentary filmmaking really is about those that relationship and how much is on screen and. So anyway, that was a particularly no. I think challenge. that actually gets it to the heart of what this is. I mean, you you know, being a one person crew, you could get yourself. It seems like in a situation where they might over trust and forget. Is there a moment? I'm, I'm, let me put that in a question. Is there a moment sometimes where you feel like they forget that you're making a film about them? Yeah, you want that. You want that. <laughs> you do. You, sure. you want over trust. But you don't, you know, but then, again, you have to but be. But with great power comes great responsibility. Well, you know, uh, but the responsibility is in the editing. You know, it's not in the shooting. But it's not in the moment where the guy says, do I stay or do I go? Of course it's in the moment. I mean, you know, yes, at times it's in the moment, but... Um, You're right, yeah, that's a, sep you know, a separate responsibility. Right, and what's, what's interesting to me about first-person filmmaking is that, you know, the camera really is from your perspective. Mm -hmm. So every time you move the camera, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's emphasizing your perspective in, in a way that I think is different from verite filming. Um, and so, you know, the intimacy isn't just with the person you're filming, it's with the audience in a way. I mean, that's what my goal is, to bring people into my perspective. Yeah. 
So um, that's its own unique set of challenges. But I mean, really, every time I, like, you, every, you know, every time you put the camera down, it means something. You know, and oftentimes I'll leave that in the film because it represents something. You know, normally you'd cut that out of a traditional documentary. Yeah, there was actually there's one fourth wall moment in my movie actually that the gun scene where the woman came after me and hit me and I, I, I we did we we did, we fought about it in the editing room. You are giving out too many spoilers. Well, my I man. just I just it was so interesting and my editor was like, we got to cut this out and I'm like, man, who cares? You know, it's like the camera's there. I'm not trying to hide the fact, even though it's not a first person film. I'm not voicing the film. You know, I don't, and the film is, you know, 98% kind of fly on the wall, but it happened, you know, it happens. Like, there's no illusion here, really, so why not, you know? I mean, but the other shaky camera work, I cut that out, yeah. <laughs> so a lot can be sort of um, uh, fixed or healed in editing, as you were saying, Doug, but... Um, it's all in post. It's, it's all, all, all in post. post, all in post. But Lucia, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you wondered if... Um, they would regret later having said what they said and that maybe they that maybe that happened because it was just you Lucia in the room with them never no I'm just kidding yes all all the time um, actually um, th the film that I'm one cut there's a lot of scenes like that Jane being resistant in fact it's so interesting because I would have to prepare myself and and uh, every day to see if she was in the mood or not in the mood to be filmed. And, and it was a constant gaining of trust. And it was so interesting, because about uh, two months before Ed died, she turned to me, she goes, you know, why aren't you shooting us now? Because I'm so much nicer. When you were filming me, I wasn't so nice. And I said, yeah, that's why I decided to stop filming, because I needed you to f have this year with your husband where you were really nice. Um, I mean, it's it's not like she's n not amazing and complex character on screen and all that stuff, but I, I made a decision, to s both Ed and I made a decision to stop filming earlier than we might what might have because of her her ambivalence. It was a, it was a, it was sort of an on again, off again approval and disapproval of what we were doing. So it was constantly fluid and constantly changing. But I think that um, she, yeah, one of the most powerful scenes in the, the film is an opening scene where she's just so resistant. And she even said to Ed, burn the tape, don't show it to Lucia. And my assistant editor said to me, you shouldn't look at this footage. And I said, I wanna see that footage right now. Um, because I think that was the core of, of, of the dialogue in the, in the film, and it actually is her first scene in the movie. So, Any questions right now? And she approved of it. It's not like I used Certainly there her. are questions <laughs> There are no there. questions. How can that be? Um, so, well, we'll continue then. Um, th so as you're describing this, it sounds like there's almost, um, oh, you do have a question. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, right, done? yes, please. Subjects before, or at what stage do you show your cuts? Very to good your question. Uh, certainly, my autobi autobiographical ones, absolutely. Yeah. They're the first to see it. Um, and generally, at the f I show the samples, um, the work in progress samples, the fundraising samples, so that early on they get a sense. Um, uh, which, by the way, you know, I do edit. Um, and I think that's actually a really good opportunity to get to know your story really well is is by cutting your own fundraising sample but that's a whole other panel um, uh, want to stay another hour no. <laughs> um, but yeah I, I showed um, I felt for 112 weddings it was really important for the, all the 10 wedding couples in there to see it before it was shown publicly last night so a couple of weeks ago um, we got as many of them, three of the couples live out of the New York area, but the ones, so that's like 14 altogether individuals, seven couples, and 11 of the 14 made it to this little mini screening we had at HBO. Um, I, it was so much more nerve wracking than last night was. <laughs> um, because like you just don't know how people are gonna react to it. I mean, I didn't think there was much, you know, but there, there are a couple of moments in there where I felt like, oh, they could get a little upset that um, uh, because they, they, they didn't realize how much they were revealing and, or how much is revealed just by a, um, 
uh, by their body language or the non, you know, the, the facial expressions or even a pause after I asked the question. Could, you know, with an audience take on, you know, uh, yeah, as I saw last night, can, can be a, uh, a lot funnier than, uh, and play comically. And I didn't want them to see it for the first time with an audience and have them laughing and have them misinterpret it. So um, uh, I know not every filmmaker does that. Um, but I, I had to, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I felt with that kind of trust and responsibility came an obligation to share it privately and, and to um, discuss it at length. I mean, what, what I think you'd have to be careful about, and I certainly was mindful of, is um, um, how you, first of all, how you offer that to your subjects and what their expectations about what their rights creatively and, um, you know, are they, are you offering them the right to change your film or how are you going to talk about it? I mean, that's, that's, um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess I would also, I mean, it, I wanted my subjects to be able to share the film with an audience, and, and I knew that there, because it was a lot of intimate material that they would need to really see the film well before that and to be comfortable with it and to, to begin to get comfortable with it. And nothing's going to prepare them to see it with an audience, but that's first what needs to happen is a private screening. But um, but of course, I would you know want to make sure that I, I had the legal right to do what I wanted before that, because I think if you don't, um, you put yourself in a particularly you know, tough situation. You know, I don't. I don't think any of us would probably risk that. Um, so, first-person films, by the way, are a whole different category. I mean, for, not for a family films with your yeah. personal documentaries about your family is a whole other thing because you're, you know, the 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 conflict there is you 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 want for your film to have conflict and drama and all that, but you don't want it in real life and you want to protect them, but you also want to exploit them. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a very tricky situation. With the kids grow up, I, um, you know, I actually had a, you know, a deal with my daughter, which was that she could just pull the plug on it at any time during the filming. And um, she saw the, f I, I prepared 30 minutes of footage for her. She went off to college, and when first time she came back, I just put the toughest 30 minutes together so that nothing would surprise her later down the line. I just said, tell me now. If this is going to ruin your life, tell me now it goes on the shelf because I'm going to go out and have to raise some money, like a lot of money. And I don't want you later coming back and saying, Dad, this is ruining my life. Um, so there's... There's a lot of tricky stuff to navigate there, and and um, personal documentaries are tough, tough, tough because of the delicate family issues, and the, you know there's always bound to be one or two members of the family who don't want it filmed, don't want to reveal the skeletons of the family closet. Um, very, very tricky to navigate. Uh, yes, I don't I need to add anything. We're actually, oh. are we? Do we have time for one more? We've pretty much done. One minute. Can Very you quick. ask it fast? Okay, so yeah. I'm actually working on a personal documentary about my family and about myself. So I was wondering um, how you go about, A, sometimes when you're not filming, you hear things that you're like, oh, shit, this could totally, like, I'd like to film you saying exactly this and I don't have my camera. Do you, what's the line between setting something up and being creative with, you know, verite? Like, there's only so many ways that you can show your mom cooking or your dad doing what he does on a daily basis. Like there needs to be like a creative way to really introduce characters. Is it okay to set something up? And how do you go about doing that so that it's uh, natural? Um, I will shoot them in a situation, but I won't, I won't ever tell them what to do. Right. You know, I'd never have them perform something for the camera. Um, uh, but I think a lot of it is thinking through and anticipating the moments that you might want to get. You know, do I want to get a scene of, you know, my mother cooking dinner? You know, and then you just sort of wait for the right time to do it, right circumstance and all that. But yeah, that's going to happen all the time is, oh, I wish I had rolled on that or could have rolled on that. And you just got to kind of let it go as if it never happened. Um, you just got to work with what you get. And um, 
then think through how can I get something similar. But you know, if if you get too hung up on what they said and try and get that, it's going to be next to impossible. You know, and, and I I think that you have conversations with your family over and over again. So asking them a couple times, you know, and revisiting topics, maybe not even intentionally, that that will be a way to get to the topic or the theme that you're trying to get to. I think that's okay. It's very natural. It's not an ethical thing. Um, I mean, if you're tricking them, that might be one thing. But I think that um, I asked my dad several times the same question, and it was like he answered them differently each time. So thank you guys for coming. I encourage you to seek out their films that they've made in the past and also remember Jesse's films Trust tomorrow. me, I didn't give tonight. it all away. So. It, no, he did not. Uh, Jesse's film is tonight in Cinema One, and Lucia's yours is tomorrow thank in Cinema you, One. Thank you, Robin. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so guys much. for being here.